The Magicka Warden has officially made its comeback, and in perhaps the most unique way that we've ever seen. Being the first class to have its meta spec come from frost damage, the Magicka Warden is in great shape to not only provide some very strong DPS, but also provide incredible raid utility. This guide will not only keep you up to date on all of the major changes coming with the Fire Song DLC, but also give you all the tools that you need to know in order to maximize your damage on the Warden. Be sure to check the timestamps if there is any one section you'd prefer to learn over another, or if you simply need to rewatch some things, as we have many details regarding this class that we will be discussing. With that said, let's get into it. The Fire Song update has finally given endgame players a chance to breathe. The Warden sees the most changes of any class this patch, but overall, the amount of actual change is very little, and the small adjustments that do exist all work very well together. Most of the changes to the Warden revolve around passives. Advanced Species now increases crit damage by up to 4%, rather than giving penetration, Glacial Presence now increases the damage done by your chilled status effect on a value determined by your highest offensive stat, rather than adding 10% crit damage to chilled targets. This basically changes a passive that was completely useless into a passive that adds about 5k DPS just for existing with this specific setup. Piercing Cold now increases raw damage output by up to 2% at base, which increases to up to 12% when using an Ice Staff, rather than increasing your Magic and Frost damage by up to 10%. Another huge buff to the class. Lastly, two major skills received some changes that make them worth using over other alternatives. The Warden gets a new class ability that we can utilize this patch, as the cap in damage previously placed on Arctic Blast has now been removed making this a very strong option. Finally, Elemental Susceptibility has received a few changes, the most important being that the morph now applies each Elemental Status Effect, that is, Burning, Chilled, and Concussed, every 6 seconds, rather than applying a random one. This ensures roughly 66% uptimes on all three status effects, making this a must-have skill on the Warden when running a staff, as the damage that we get from Burning is already pretty strong, but also the damage that we now get from Chilled is worthwhile as well. Likewise, the duration now lasts only 30 seconds as opposed to 60, and the range has been increased by 2 meters. And that's it! That is all the major changes this patch. This is such a great change of pace, and I hope to see this section of my videos in the future remain not much longer than this. Getting into the basic build information for the patch, not a ton has changed here. This patch we are opting for High Elf, as not only does this class provide 100 more max mag, but the sustain that this class provides is very helpful when balancing our mag and stamina based resources. As an equal damage dealing option, you could go for Dark Elf. The benefit of running this class is that it gives an equal amount of magicka and stamina, allowing you to switch back and forth between mag and stam specs. However, this class does give 100 less max mag, which is honestly a negligible damage difference, but I did find it very difficult to sustain this rotation as a Dark Elf. As an alternative, you could opt to be a Khajiit. This race isn't particularly helpful in 12-man content, but it could be pretty useful in solo and 4-man content to ensure that we're constantly hitting that crit damage cap when we don't have group buffs provided to us. For our Mundus' patch, we will be sticking with the Thief, this will be the strongest option in all 12-man content. A decent alternative to consider for solo and 4-man content, however, would be the lever. For any situation where you might not be able to meet the pen cap. The Warden doesn't have too many of these situations though, as you'd likely need more light armor in this type of content for the sake of sustain, and you could always use the other morph of Shocks as well for Major Breach, so I do feel that this option is pretty niche. For our attributes, we are dumping all 64 points into mag. It shouldn't be necessary for the sake of sustain or survivability in 12-man content to allocate these points anywhere else, so we'll take the highest damage gain that we can by making our mag pool as high as possible. For our consumables, we have plenty of situational options to consider. In general, we will opt to use Ghastly Eyeball, which offers a fair amount of max mag in a lot of Magicka recovery. Resources do get a little sketchy, but with a well-performed Roto, you should be about perfect without having to run the Betty. That said, if you find that you are able to sustain it, max mag food will provide the most overall damage. 
Again, this will only hold true, however, if you are able to sustain it, as magging out will result in a pretty hefty damage loss. Likewise, in content, if you find that you need a little more survivability, you can opt to run Bystat Food, which offers max mag and health. If you end up deciding that Bystat is a necessity for a fight, you can help your sustain by using a mag skill or adding a stam flex skill, a concept that will be discussed in more detail in the flex skills section of the video. Finally, as an interesting alternative, if you find that for whatever reason you are struggling to sustain stamina, you can opt for Crunchy Spider Skewer, which offers max mag and stam recovery. For our potions this patch, we will be opting to run the Alliance Spell Power or Essence of Spell Power potions, as Magicka is our absolute primary resource. These will give us the most overall damage increase in content. You can craft Essence of Spell Power by combining Cornflower, Lady Smock, and Water Hyacinth. As a potential alternative, you could consider using Heroism Pots. On a Warden, this won't be super common though, as it would require us to double bar Inner Light, forcing us to replace important front bar skills with a buff not quite as strong, and for us to drop one of our stronger back bar dots as well. These potions are also very expensive, as they require Dragon Room, Dragon's Blood, and Columbine to craft. The only place where I could see these being meta might be in bursty fights, where we might opt to run the Destro ult or Meteor over our bear, but again, these situations are far and few between. For our champion points this patch, we will be opting to run Deadly Aim, Master at Arms, Wrathful Strikes, and Exploiter. This is a little different than what we've seen in recent patches, so allow me to explain a little bit. Wrathful Strikes has always been the next best CP alternative to a more traditional setup whenever you have sufficient crit buffs in group to run over Backstabber or Fighting Finesse. Since the dummy now gives EC buffs, we can opt to drop our crit damage CP altogether. That said, skills like Bird, Beetles, Arlet Attacks, and other non-dot type abilities account for a large portion of our overall damage. In general, if a CP node cannot buff at least 48% of your overall damage, you should run Exploiter instead assuming solid uptimes on off balance. This rule has always existed, it's just more relevant in recent patches, as we would historically use Biting Aura, but nearly every dot in AoE in the game has gotten pretty significantly nerfed with lost depths, making it less worth using. That said, you can only run Exploiter in Raid if your support are maintaining solid uptimes with off balance, as subpar uptimes will make running Biting Aura more worth it. So that said, as some situational CP alternatives to keep in mind, if crit damage buffs are not sufficient, whether it be a lack of medium armor on your end or a lack of buff uptimes on the support end, you should opt to run Fighting Finesse or Backstabber. If you cannot consistently flank your target for the entire fight, Fighting Finesse will be stronger. If your support isn't keeping up off balance sufficiently, you can run Biting Aura instead. Force of Nature is a really solid CP alternative to keep in mind for AoE type fights, as it will ensure that the most important debuff in the game, Penetration, is kept up sufficiently on multiple targets. Finally, Exploiter is also really strong in trash pulls when a crow is running Scythe, as Scythe provides guaranteed off balance, and in a short fight that lasts around 10 seconds like a trash pull should, you'll have this damage bonus for 80 to 100% of the pull. Getting into the different gear setups that you can run on the Warden this patch, I'd like to start off by discussing the different traits and enchants that will run across all setups. To start, we'll opt to run six of our pieces as the medium weight and one as the lightweight. Feel free to add another light piece or two for the sake of your sustain, as not only does the Warden suffer a bit from lack of resources on this setup, but the class itself struggles for crit as well, making the damage difference between light and medium armor razor thin. For our body pieces, we'll run them all as the Divine Strait with Max Magicka enchants. On the Jewelry, we're running them all as the Bloodthirsty trait with Spell Damage enchants. Note that in a raid setting, you can swap between Weapon and Spell Damage enchants depending on your comp. You do have to be aware of the special classes providing special buffs, as the goal is to stack one type of each stat as possible, that is, either Spell or Weapon Damage, either Spell or Weapon Crit, and so on. For example, DKs give the minor weapon damage buff, and Plars give the minor spell damage buff. Likewise, Sorks give the minor spell crit buff, and Blades give the minor weapon crit buff. If you have all of these classes in your comp, you can switch between spell and weapon damage enchants freely. Otherwise, since we're running Alliance Spell Pots, we'll want to try to stack spell damage and spell crit, meaning that we want a Plar and a Sork in the comp. If you don't have a Plar, but you do have a DK, you'll have to stack weapon damage enchants and either run D-Gen on your back bar or have the DK tank run Igneous Weapons in order to get the major weapon damage buff. 
This is because without a player in our comp, we have no source of the minor spell damage buff, but only have a source of the minor weapon damage buff with a DK. So we'll get more overall DPS by stacking into the weapon damage bonuses that our raid comp provides. With this setup, we are opting to run double ice staffs, with our front bar being charged and our back bar being infused. Again, mainly due to some of the changes with passives that increase our damage by 12% with an ice staff equipped. Getting into the actual gear setups for the patch, as an absolute beginner setup, I'd recommend using Order's Wrath and Mother's Sorrow. Order's Wrath is an incredibly strong set that can be crafted in High Isle, offering a ton of spell crit and crit damage. Mother Sorrow is a very strong overland set from Deshaun that offers a ton of spell crit. Both of these sets can also be purchased from guild traders. An interesting alternative that seems pretty easy to obtain that could potentially be stronger than Mother Sorrow is Back Alley Gormand. This is an overland set that comes from the new zone Galen, meaning that it will also be able to be purchased from guild traders. It will give more crit chance than Mother Sorrow, assuming that your resting crit chance, that is, your crit chance with gear, CP, Mundus food, etc. is roughly above 30%. This will be very easy to do on the dummy and in raid, but maybe a little more difficult to achieve in solo or four-man content. For our meta setups this patch, we're looking at a pretty interesting setup on the Warden that is the first ever meta build setup that integrates ice staves. We're opting to run Reliquin on the body, paired with Pillar of Nern, with this set being on the back bar, Zahn, and the Master's Ice Staff on the front bar. That said, let's take a brief moment to take an in-depth look at the current list of meta sets that we have access to this patch in order to better understand our meta setups for single target and AoE type fights. Appearing on your screen is a graphic made by the legendary Skinny Cheeks outlining some of the best sets in the game ranked on a chart. In this explanation, even though Solzon is an absolute S tier set, I'm going to go ahead and label that as really a trash only set and replace it with Pillar of Nern. In terms of these three dot sets, the highest damage dealing set is Reliquent, doing around 8 to 10k DPS, and both Pillar and Whirl outputting around 7 to 9k DPS. Pillar has a slight edge on Whirl when comparing 100% uptimes on both sets, but Whirl is nearly identical nonetheless. Both Reliquin and Pillar will perform the greatest in pure single target fights, as Reliquin has no cleave component to it whatsoever, and Pillar's cleave radius is remarkably small, like within 2 meters or less. However, both of these sets act as dots only, meaning that they can be maintained in a fight where the boss is very mobile. War of Depths, however, has a actual sticky dot portion of its proc, as well as a ground-based AoE element to it, making it a set that's weaker on fights where your target moves a lot, but a stronger AoE option than either of the other sets on fights where the targets don't move. Likewise, Sororia puts out about as much damage as Pillar and Whirl, but is only effective in a relatively stationary fight, where you don't have to move very often. Sororia can work in mobile fights, but it does have a high mastery curve. With any of these sets, dropping Reli or Sororia stacks would make running Pillar and or Whirl more beneficial than running either Reliquin or Sororia. One final element to note is that Pillar is slightly more effective than Sororia on a stam spec, and Sororia is slightly more effective than Pillar on a mag spec, as Pillar offers a line of stam and Sororia offers a line of mag. So for this class, in terms of raw damage output, I would rank the sets as follows. Reliquin, Sororia, Pillar, Whirl. That said, some fights fall out of the range of even Whirl, making Bosse and Riptide still relevant. In AoE fights that are mobile and or don't allow for tight stacking, Bosse will likely be the best option. The best example of this fight type is Rock Grove. Oxildso is a fight that simply cannot be tightly stacked, and Bosse is a very mobile fight where ad stacks can't always be pristine. Bosse will likely be the go-to for these fights. So with that, incorporating the Master's Ice Staff, a set used on the front bar, is unlike any other setup on any other class in the game. This puts us in a rough position, as we want to attempt to equip a medium set on the body and a proc set that has a long dot and cooldown on the back bar. Of these options, neither Reliquin, Sororia, or Bosse will be effective back barred, leaving us to choose only Pillar or Whirl for this slot. Pillar of Nern lines up best with our timers, meaning that it can be kept up a bit more reliably, and on its own offers slightly more damage than Whirl anyway, so that is an easy choice. 
For our body, Reliquin is the only medium set of our remaining options, and our highest DPS set of these options anyway. This gives us a very clear and definitive answer regarding the best setup for a pure single target fight. For an AoE situation, however, neither Reliquin or Pillar will be preferable. If we stick to using the Master's Ice Staff, we'll likely either end up running the Master's and Maelstrom Ice Staff, opting to drop the monster set and use something like Bosse Zogvins, or depending on the stack, we might be able to keep up Pillar and run Sororia or World of Depths. One final option is to run a monster set, three pieces of a set like Zogvins, which offers crit, and then run a set like Sororia or Bosse. Of these options, I'm not sure which would likely provide the most AoE damage on this class, but any of these options will likely work very well with one setup performing better than another situationally. Be sure to join the Discord in order to stay up to date about information regarding this build, including some of the best AoE boss type setups, as I will add new information to the written guides as the patch progresses and we get more chances to test these setups in content. With that, as some honorable mentions, Zogvins is one set that was used pretty widely, especially in newer content that is only slightly less relevant this patch, Zogvins allows the wearer to remove their source of minor force in favor of a different skill, making it most optimal now for fights that require the user to perform solo mechanics outside of a group, giving them the ability to potentially slot a heal. Examples of this include VSS or VCR portals. Another setup worth mentioning, especially for PC players, is the Elfbane Mechanical Acuity setup, as this provides the strongest overall burst damage for PvE over the course of a fight roughly 30 seconds or less. An example of this fight type might be the Snake in VRG or the Spider in VHoth. Finally, as a couple of alternatives to proc sets that I feel are worth mentioning, both Kinra and Advancing are still very strong sets that can be run as alternatives to any of the previously mentioned options. Kinra is best suited for shorter AoE fights, and Advancing is best suited for longer AoE fights, pairing either set with one of the trial options mentioned earlier. I don't believe these sets will really ever be meta, but they aren't that far off if you have nothing else to run. For our trash sets this patch, we don't yet have a ton of info on exactly what will be meta. Again, be sure to join the Discord to get updated information regarding this build as the patch progresses and we get to test more things in content. This information primarily pertains to PC, but I believe is important for console players to be aware of as well in order to better be able to optimize for console rating. I believe that simply due to the nature of the strongest AoE abilities in the game and how these abilities do their best damage with the Flame Staff, that we won't really be changing anything set-wise or really weapon-wise, still opting to run likely Daggers and an Inferno Staff in trash situations. The most common trash setup includes running Souls On on the body and Burning Spellweave on the back bar. Both of these sets allow for incredibly strong and easy to control burst damage. You can even mechanically time out exactly when you get Burning Spellweave to proc if you are familiar with the average time your team clears each trash pool. The most optimal time to proc Burning Spellweave would simply be to attempt to allow the last second of the proc to tick as the trash pull is dying. This isn't necessary by any means, but just a little tip to maximize trash damage. A common alternative to the setup is to stick one person in Ozzer Blight, as this is the highest AoE damage set in the game. This set can only be run on one person in the group though, so if nobody else can run it, feel free to. On console, however, you obviously won't have time to really change much for these trash pulls. With this being the case, I think that it's fine to keep the double ice staffs equipped and simply run Frost Pulsar as an AoE spammable and to run Shooting Star as your ultimate for quick burst in trash pulls. Again, I'm not positive about this section and there is likely more testing that needs to be done for a more definite answer, so make sure you join the Discord to get updated information so that I can get it to you as soon as I see it. For our Mythics this patch, the Kilt is by no means dead on this class, it's just not the most optimal Mythic to run if your group has all of the crit buffs active and if the uptimes are consistent. If your group does not maintain solid uptimes or are missing any of the relevant crit damage buffs, you'll run the Kilt over your monster set. Otherwise, in fights where mobility isn't really important, you can opt to run the Sea Serpent's Coil instead, which will provide very comparable damage in most situations, assuming that you can maintain the proc conditions of the set reliably. If you cannot maintain the proc conditions, and if all crit damage buffs are present and consistent, you'll opt to simply drop the Mythic altogether. For our monster sets this patch, Kielnar will provide the most overall single target damage, but unfortunately only one person in group can run this set as the effect does not stack. The next best single target option would be Zahn. In terms of overall damage, DPS though, Zahn is very competitive with Kjolnar as it offers a line of crit chance, making this helm near identical in overall DPS output to Kjolnar and coincidentally, 
the helm used in the parse. There are some fights in the game where Zahn cannot be run though, so if the fight does not allow for good uptimes with the set, Stormfist will be the next best option. Stormfist also works very well for tightly stacked AoE fights. If you find yourself in an AoE situation, however, where the stack cannot reliably be maintained, I'd recommend using Grothdar instead. And finally, for our arena weapons this patch, the obvious weapon to discuss is the Master's Ice Staff. The Warden lacks a very strong class spammable, unlike many other classes in the game, making room for the Master's Staff plus Destructive Reach to provide the most overall DPS when using a staff. The damage from Destructive Reach itself is only slightly weaker than the class spammable Cliff Racer, but the added spell damage given upon activation makes it incredibly powerful. As a couple of other options worth mentioning, despite the nerf to the Maelstrom Inferno, this weapon proves to be really strong in AoE fights and slightly stronger than a great sword setup on the Warden in single target fights. Even without the touch to Winner's Revenge, which increases the damage of the skill by 30% with a staff equipped, the Maelstrom Inferno would be dead even or even slightly ahead of a great sword setup anyway. Finally, the Asylum Daggers are really strong for trash pulls in combination with Whirling Blades, as it buffs one of the strongest AoE burst spammables in the game. This is more for PC though, as on console, it likely won't be worth swapping the gear and skills required to run the Asylum Daggers efficiently. Getting into our primary skills, that is, the skills that we will use on the dummy, that act as a baseline to revisit when making decisions about which flex skills to run situationally. Starting with Subterranean Assault, this is the absolute most important skill on our bar. It was reworked and nerfed quite a bit last patch, but it does still account for over 10% of our total DPS when applied correctly. The skill casts a total of two ticks, the first attacking three seconds after the initial cast, and the second three seconds after the first tick. This makes this skill one that you want to hit once every six skill casts, much like Power of the Light on the Templar, or similar to Daedric Prey on the Sork, ensuring that you do not recast the skill too early, as well as ensuring that you are reapplying it immediately upon expiration is the key to doing damage on this class. Destructive Reach is our primary spammable. The skill itself does decent damage, but when paired with the Master's Ice Staff, casting the skill at least once every four seconds becomes imperative to our overall DPS. Upon cast, the staff provides 600 spell damage. Likewise, the skill applies Minor Brittle to your target every single time, making it a very reliable source of a very important buff for group DPS. A pretty unique and versatile skill to say the least. Cutting Dive may look like a second spammable, but is actually a skill that we use for the the dot it provides. Upon activation, if your enemy is not off balance, it applies a very strong bleed to the target that lasts for 10 seconds. In my experience, when parsing with this skill, the timing usually works out very well for the majority of the fight, as off balance only lasts 7 or 8 seconds at a time at the most. If the bleed doesn't apply when you cast the skill, just weave this in between reapplications of other dots, including your master's buff, until the bleed does apply itself. Likewise, this skill can be a very strong alternative to use as a spammable if you are out of magicka and can't afford to cast Destructive Reach or any other mag skill for that matter. Barb Trap is primarily on our bar for minor force. The dot from Trap itself does tick for decent damage, but this skill is primarily a buff, not only providing the aforementioned minor force, but also increasing our weapon and spell damage by 3%, thanks to the Fighter's Guild passive Slayer. Scalding Rune is a pretty decent dot, but likely the weakest on our bar. This skill provides... Pretty decent AoE burst damage, assuming that the add stack is very tight and that the rune is placed well. We run the skill on our front bar for the Mage's Guild passive, one of which increases our max magicka, providing an additional buff to our most important abilities on our front bar. Wild Guardian is our ultimate of choice. This is one of the only ults in the game that you can passively have actively doing damage throughout an entire fight. This bear is our highest damage dealing ability, accounting for about 15k DPS between its three attacks over the course of a fight. This is an absolute must have in any single target fight on the Warden. Winner's Revenge is our strongest damage over time ability in this setup. The raw damage output has less than a 1k DPS difference between that of Pillar of Nerd. One of the biggest reasons for this revolves around a unique element to the skill which increases in damage by 30% when using a destruction staff. Winner's Revenge also has a 200% chance to apply chilled, further helping to increase our damage via the new Glacial Presence passive. Unstable Wall is a pretty strong skill on this setup, but not as important as before when we would opt to use the Maelstrom Inferno. Since we get no bonus damage to our wall, it simply becomes another decent skill that does decent damage. This Morpha Wall can be used as an AoE spammable sorts as well, as reapplying the skill causes it to explode in a very large rate. 
radius. Elemental Susceptibility has received an incredible change as well, making it a very strong DPS skill to use when running a staff. This skill now applies all three status effects once every six seconds, rather than rotating the status effect once every six seconds. This allows for very high burning and shield up times, two powerful dots that add a ton of damage on the Warden. Not only that, having Elemental Susceptibility active on a target in combination with either Frost or Shock Wall of Elements will ensure very high uptimes on Brittle and Off Balance as well making it much easier to provide solid uptimes on very important buffs in raid situations. Arctic Blast received a pretty solid change this patch, again removing the damage cap the skill once had. This change gives the Warden another pretty strong class damage dealing ability, one that is stronger than Scalding Rune but not quite as strong as Wall for a frame of reference. This skill also does heal on initial cast, making it a skill that is versatile for solo mech situations like VSS or VCR portals for example. The heal is not very strong, but it likely will be enough for advanced players in these situations. Fetcher Infection is one of the stronger dots in our toolkit, and one of the most reliable sources of minor vulnerability. If for whatever reason you don't have a Warden support in group, this will be a must-have for the sake of group damage. Otherwise, it's just another dot, slightly stronger than all of our other mediocre dots. And with that, we do have our bear double barred simply so that it doesn't despawn when bar swapping, as having to resummon the bear every bar swap would obviously be a massive damage loss. Getting into the flex skills for the den this patch, that is, the skills that we should be aware of and consider running over some of our primary skills depending on certain raid situations. Starting in the Animal Companions tree with Blue Betty, this skill is a go-to when buy stat food is necessary in content for the sake of our sustain. We can barely sustain Ghastly as is without this skill, and that is with a piece of light armor, so when we need more survivability, we'll have to use this skill to sustain our normal bar setup. Having the skill on our bar also buffs that bar's damage through the Advanced Species Passive, which offers 4% crit damage per Animal Companion ability slotted. This note could be helpful for maintaining crit cap consistently, assuming you were to drop a Mythic in Raid like we do on the Dummy. Bird of Prey is a decent skill to slot for the sake of buffing your front bar for burst damage. When activated, the skill offers Major Expedition, increasing movement speed by 30%, and also while slotted, the skill offers Minor Berserk. That said, Minor Berserk is sourced from Combat Prayer in a raid situation or even camo hunter which when discussing front bar buff options stacks up a little bit better camo hunter offers minor berserk major prophecy and savagery and three percent weapon and spell damage due to the slayer passive in the fighters guild making bird of prey really only a good skill if the speed bonus helps makes it different in a fight for whatever reason in the green balance tree, starting with Enchanted Growth, this is one of the stronger and more instant burst heal options that we have access to on the Warden. While not our absolute strongest healing option, it does offer a very strong heal that we can get immediately, as well as offers Minor Intellect and Endurance, which increases our Mag and Stam recovery by 15% for 20 seconds. Our strongest heal, however, is Living Trellis. The only downside to this skill is that it does not provide an immediate heal. Instead, the first cast places a heal over time on you, and reactivating the skill before it runs out provides a massive burst heal. In situations where you shouldn't really need to react quickly to incoming damage, this will be your go-to option. In the Winner's Embrace tree, Expansive Frost Cloak is a good skill to be aware of. If you don't have a Warden Support in group for whatever reason, Frost Cloak is a must-have for mitigation, as this skill provides major resolve, which increases spell and physical resistances by nearly 6,000 for 20 seconds. In the dual wield tree, Whirling Blades is the strongest AoE burst spammable in the game, especially when combined with the Asylum Daggers, specifically for burst-oriented fights. Note that Silver Shards is likely a stronger AoE spammable for long fights like Reef Guardian or Bosse, but not only will Whirling Blades do the best for AoE burst type fights like Trash Pulls, we also won't be able to sustain a skill like Silver Shards in a long fight, making Whirling Blades again really only good for Trash Pulls where we won't have to use the skill too many times to get its max effect. In the Destruction Staff tree, Force Pulse is the next strongest non-class mag spammable that we have access to, and one that provides a good amount of AoE damage as well. With how important Destructive Reach is for buffing our damage, I can't see Force Pulse being used, maybe except for situations that require extreme cleave, like in a massive AoE fight, such as boss A hard mode, for example. Elemental Rage, when using an Inferno Staff, this skill becomes the next best ultimate that we can use on the Warden and the burstiest AoE ult in the game. If you ever opt to run an Inferno Staff, at least on the back bar in any AoE type fight, whether it be Trash or the aforementioned Bossé type fight, we should use this ultimate over the bear. 
In the Fighter's Guild tree, Camo Hunter is a good skill for buffing front bar and therefore burst damage, as it buffs your front bar damage through the Slayer passive, as well as offers minor berserk when flanking a target, allowing a buff typically provided by the healer to be sourced a little bit more consistently on your own. On a mag spec, we are usually better off buffing our front bar damage with Inner Light, but this skill is a great option to consider for fights like Vass, where healers cannot reliably maintain minor berserk, as you will typically be out of range of the healer's combat prayer. In the Mage's Guild tree, Inner Light is the best buff option when running ult pots. As mentioned earlier, I don't really think there are any situations that I would recommend running ult pots, but it's not unheard of. Inner Light offers a 5% max magicka buff in addition to Major Prophecy, which is a buff currently sourced by the spell power potions we normally run, also being a buff that we would not have if we ran ult pots. So if you find yourself in that situation for whatever reason, you would likely have to double bar Inner Light to sufficiently source those buffs. Degeneration or Structured Entropy is a solid flex skill to be aware of, about as strong as Scalding Rune or Caltrops. Degeneration provides the spell and weapon damage buffs that our spell and weapon power potions provide, making it a good skill to run if you ever have to use heroism pots. Structured Entropy does just as much damage, but offers a decent heal over time as well, making it very strong for solo type situations in 12-man content where you need to step away from healers. Shooting Star will likely be the strongest AoE ultimate that we can run on the Warden when using an Ice Staff. The aforementioned skill Elemental Rage is really only at its best with an Inferno Staff, but Shooting Star does not depend on a Staff type to do its damage. The radius is a little smaller and not quite as bursty, but it will outperform the Frost version of the Destruction Staff Ultimate, in terms of AoE damage especially. In the Sigic Order tree, Channeled Acceleration is an awesome skill to use either as a pre-buff to a boss fight or in wave-based trash pulls, as this skill grants minor force for 60 seconds, giving us the same buff as Trap instantly in a fight, rather than having to run in and apply Trap to receive our first couple seconds of minor force. This also allows us to drop all of our other skills first, and then drop and maintain Trap, since we would already have minor force active for quite some time. In the Undaunted tree, Mystic Orb is still very strong despite the nerfs it received, especially in Raid. The short duration makes it a little less preferable than some of our other dots in a solo situation, however, in Raid, having at least one source of the Combustion Synergy is important for overall damage for the group, as this synergy not only gives a ton of damage, but also restores resources. In general, this may end up being a very slight personal DPS loss, but an overall group DPS gain for single target fights. And finally, in the Assault Tree, Anti-Calvary Caltrops is a flex option to consider on the Warden this patch. In general, Scalding Rune, Caltrops, and Degeneration all do about the same amount of damage, so you typically will pick which of these options to run based on your sustain. On the Warden, Mag Sustain can get pretty tough, especially in content when you might have to run by stat food, so adding this Stam skill in can help a lot. In addition to this, Caltrops does offer much more AoE utility than any of the aforementioned options, making this a well-rounded skill regardless of the sustain element that we typically choose it for. Proximity Detonation, this skill can be a very strong option to use as a pre-buff for trash pulls. The the goal is to time the cast so that the skill goes off pretty much right before any single ad dies, even any of the little adds, mainly because this skill scales in damage based on ads hit, so maximizing its damage requires the skill to hit as many targets as possible. Getting into the rotations section of the video, the simple introduction of a few new abilities with decent timers has made a semi-static rotation on this class very possible and effective. In my own testing, I hit about 122k with the dynamic rotation and about 119k with the semi-static rotation. So with that, getting into the semi-static rotation, we have three main categories of skills. Our group A abilities consist of our 10 second timers, that is Wall of Elements, and we will overcast Winner's Revenge a little early at 10 seconds as well. I do not include Cutting Dive into this category simply because I feel that the skill didn't line up very well statically. Our group B abilities are going to be cast once every 20 seconds, really only overcasting Scalding Rune here, which isn't the end of the world as it does have a very strong burst element to it. Those skills are Arctic Blast, Trap, Scalding Rune, and Fetcher. Finally, our group C skills. These are the skills that we cast dynamically, when none of our group A or B skills need to be reapplied. We will cast these skills only during spammable phases in the rotation. Those skills are Beetles, Destructive Reach, Cutting Dive, Elemental Susceptibility, and or our ultimate. Timer-wise, Cutting Dive and Elemental Susceptibility are the only skills that you'll need to keep track of. Obviously, you'll track your ultimate and cast that when ready, and you'll try to cast Destructive Reach at least once every four skills and simply spam it when nothing else needs to be reapplied, and cast your Beetles once every six skills whenever possible. As a few tips specifically related to the static rotation of our Group C skills, the most important is Subterranean Assault. 
You'll always use the skill as a priority, attempting to use it again once every six skill casts. After that, keeping the master's buff active as long as possible is your next most important priority. Destructive Reach is not only your go-to spammable, but it provides a massive buff that can only be maintained if used once every four skill casts. Elemental Susceptibility is your next most important in this group, as it is responsible for most of our burning and shield damage. Finally, Cutting Dive. If the bleed does not get reapplied on cast, it means that the boss is likely off balance, and you can either spam the skill for a little bit and weave in Destructive Reach once every four casts, or just simply move on. There will likely be at least a couple of sections throughout the parse where you are drained on Magicka as well. If Mag is getting low, you can use Cutting Dive as a spammable, again, only using Reach when the Master's buff is going to drop until you get a Shard or Potion to restore your resources. With that said, let's take a look at the actual rotation. Starting off with our pre-buff here, we'll begin by throwing Arctic Blast, Beetles, then Scalding Rune, and Trap. At this point, we will throw the first Light Attack, which will signal the opening of the parse. That opening goes... Fetcher, Wall, Winner's Revenge, Shocks, and then we start a spammable phase of the rotation, at which point we'll utilize our Group C abilities, that is Elemental Susceptibility, Destructive Reach, Beetles, and Cutting Dive. Here we'll apply Elemental Susceptibility for the first time, and then we'll throw Destructive Reach to activate the Master's buff, and this will also be the last second of Off Balance, so we'll be able to apply Cutting Dive immediately after. Throughout this phase, we'll throw a total of eight Group C abilities, which I'll just refer to as spammables here before getting into the actual rotation. The actual rotation goes Wall, Winner's Revenge, Arctic Blast, Trap, Scalding Rune, Fetcher, and then four spammables, Wall, Winner's Revenge, and then eight spammables. And after that set of spammables, we repeat. Taking a quick look at a couple of nuances with the rotation, you'll notice here that the spammable portion is truly what makes up the rotation. The rotation itself is relatively static, but the four abilities that we do use dynamically will determine exactly how clean this rotation goes. It's important to again make sure that we're not letting shocks drop as often as possible, only really letting that ever happen when we're reapplying all of our abilities. Zoning in on two different elements of this parse, the first of which is kind of what to do whenever you see that cutting dive doesn't reapply the dot that means that the boss is off balance which will last no more than seven seconds so i just kind of weave in cutting dive a little bit more than normal making sure that destructive reach is being cast once every four seconds the other point to mention is that with this rotation we are overcasting a lot of magicka based abilities but that's okay because we can use cutting dive as an equally strong spammable just like if we're trying to get Cutting Dive to reapply itself, we will cast Cutting Dive as our primary spammable until we get a shard or a potion to continue spamming Destructive Reach, but ensure that we're at least weaving in Destructive Reach once every four skill casts in order to keep up our Master's buff. Getting into our dynamic rotation, the Warden Roto has gotten pretty significantly more complicated with this setup, but is a very fun rotation to perform in my opinion. In general, the rotation is crutched around casting your beetles once every six skills, and then weaving in skills as they expire between that cadence. We also have two spammables on this class, Destructive Reach, which will be our go-to, and Cutting Dive, which will act mainly as a dot. In a situation where you are out of mag though, you can flip the two, only casting Destructive Reach once every four seconds for the buff it provides, and using Cutting Dive as a spammable until your mag resource is restored. I'll give my complete set of parse tips in the next section of this video, but for now, let's discuss the priorities. In the event that multiple skills are about to expire at the same time, you should refer to this priority of reapplication, which simply lets you know the skills to prioritize, usually based on the damage output or based on the total damage buff provided by a certain skill. This priority goes Beetles, Winner's Revenge, Elemental Susceptibility, Trap, Ultimate, Cutting Dive, Wall, Fetcher, the Master's Buff from Destructive Reach, Arctic Blast, and Scalding Rune. With that, let's go ahead and get into the demonstration. We'll start with a pre-buff of Beetles, Scalding Rune, and then Trap, followed by our first Light Attack, which will signal the opening of the parse. That opening goes Wall, Winner's Revenge, Arctic Blast, Beetles, Fetcher, Elemental Susceptibility, Destructive Reach, and Cliff Racer. After this, we'll reapply skills on cooldown, or if we have multiple skills about to expire simultaneously, based on the aforementioned priority of reapplication. 
Outside of all of the ideas that we've discussed so far, I think that the only one that I want to take an in-depth look at in the demonstration here is the concept of utilizing Cliff Racer over Destructive Reach. This parse was actually very forgiving on my Magicka for whatever reason, so I didn't even really have to use Cliff Racer until right near the very end. Again, this concept is super simple. Just replace Destructive Reach casts with Cliff Racer and try to make sure that you're weaving in Destructive Reach once every four skill casts in order to maintain the master's buff. Before getting into the 125k parse, I'd like to discuss my tips for parsing on this class to help you maximize your damage on the dummy and in content. With that, the foundation, again the most important part of this rotation, is to cast beetles as close to on cooldown as possible. With the static rotation, just try to make sure that you use it as much as possible. With the dynamic rotation, cast this as an absolute priority. As soon as the skill expires, throw beetles right back down. Try to keep an eye on destructive clench and make sure that you're keeping your master's buff active as often as possible. It's not really worth letting anything expire to reactivate this buff, but don't reapply a skill a second early if it means that you can get another cast of destructive reach off, for example. Cutting dive is mainly active for the dot it provides, but it can also be used in situations where you are either out of or running low on magicka. Try to keep an eye on your mag bar and make good decisions regarding the use of this skill, ensuring that you never mag out or don't have enough magicka to reapply a dot that might be expiring. With that too, try to continue to maintain the master's staff buff even when using cutting dive as a spammable. Weaving in casts of destructive reach every four skills. You shouldn't have to do this very often as a shard or potion will bring your mag right back up to where it needs to be. Keep track of your Pillar of Nern proc. Maximizing damage on any class that uses this set means keeping Pillar of Nern active for as long as possible. Remember, Pillar of Nern can be maintained at 100%. When the dot is at its last second, it can be reapplied. In other words, if the timer reaches one second, swap to your bar and reapply a skill so that the damage ticks as the proc reaches zero seconds, which will then immediately reapply itself when you swap back to your front bar. With this, if you know a skill on the back bar is about to expire, you can either let it run out for an extra second or recast it a second or two early for the sake of Pillar. For example, if I see Wall of Elements has one second and Pillar has two seconds, I will let Wall of Elements expire for one second so that I can use it to reapply Pillar of Nern. If I see that Pillar has one second and Wall has two seconds, I might reapply Wall a little early if there are no other options. In general, you should allow all of your skills to fully expire before recast. Only recast skills early if another priority timer, such as your Beatles, for example, is going to prevent you from reapplying a skill once it runs out. This goes tenfold for the skills that tick once every two seconds, as recasting any of these skills early will cause you to lose a full tick of the skill's damage. The best thing that you can do is allow the skill to run out and then immediately reapply it in order to achieve back-to-back -back ticks. Skills that operate this way include Scalding Rune, Arctic Blast, and Trap. Though, I do consider Trap to be a small exception, as we mainly use this skill as a buff for the Minor Force, making it okay to reapply this one a little early if needed. Practice Weaving. In general, practice your weaving separately from your parse and get a good idea of exactly how fast you can weave your abilities individually so that you can put together different combinations of skills to weave for the sake of practice. And as a final tip, practice efficiently. Simply doing full parse after full parse is setting yourself up for failure. Isolate the weak points in your rotation, whether it be managing certain timers or weaving, and practice these elements separately from a full parse, using the full parse as a way to implement and check yourself on your practice. Thank you so much, everybody, for checking out the video. As always, if you learned something new, if you found the video helpful, do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn that notification bell on so that you know when the rest of my build guides for the patch are coming out. As always, guys, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please do let me know in the comments section below. I will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. And likewise, be sure to join the Discord so that you get access to the full written guides. I've included a condensed version of it in the description, but if you want the full version, you're going to have to join the Discord because I only have so many characters on YouTube. Likewise, I'm on Twitch, Twitter, TikTok, Patreon. Be sure to check me out on all of those platforms. Links are in the description. And a special thanks to Charles, who again provided this phenomenal parse. The link to his YouTube is in the description below. And also a shout out to Skinny Cheeks for the incredible graphic. Thank you so much, friends, for your contribution to this guide. And a special thanks to all of my current Patreons, Clyde, Reef, Flug. Thank you so much for all of your support, guys. I could not do this without you. You make these videos possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support.
And thank you so much to all of you as well for all of your love and support. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will see you in the next one. Make a little mockery, it won't do